shooting people down as they're scurrying, people trying to get away, and it's this just menacing helicopter. The helicopter is big, it's not far off the ground. It is just the scariest thing. And I'm sure that was not fiction. Uh, we know, we know that, that that kind of thing was not fiction. But all of a sudden, the helicopter just explodes. So, somebody on the ground had a, a div, you know a device, a shoulder rocket launcher or something, and it just blows up. And um, I have to confess that I was on the verge of bursting into applause when I saw that. Uh, I didn't restrain myself, but that was an automatic, almost an automatic response. Because, you know, you drop the context, you're not thinking who's who, you're not saying, oh, those are the Americans, those are the Vietnamese, whatever. You're just looking at this menacing machine, you don't even see a human being in the machine, right, a helicopter, firing death upon what looked like villagers running to get out of the way, and I'm sure there were kids in the scene too, there were women, and then you see the threat disappear, go up in a bowl of fire, and that's the end of the threat. And it seems to me the human impulse would be to say, you know, phew, if not to burst into applause. And that's why I think they don't want us to see such things. And we, they learned that we saw too much of this in, uh, during the Vietnam War on TV every night. And that was pre-cable. Now we'd be seeing it, if the, it was released, we'd be seeing it 24 hours a day. Uh, anytime you wanted, you could turn it on and watch, you know, the blood and gore of um, what's going on. Uh, this is where, of course, the, the military analysts come in that are on the, uh, uh, the networks and the cable sh shows. Uh, there's a story that, you know, made a splash in the front page of the New York Times and then basically, you know, disappeared. Uh, if it wasn't for Glenn Greenwald, we wouldn't really know any of the details of this. Uh, uh, in case you don't know the story, you know, if you watch any of these networks, and if you have been since uh, we went into, uh, we, George Bush, George the Second, I call him, went into Iraq uh, and, and Afghanistan, the, the networks and the cable uh, stations have had a parade of these retired generals and colonels, decorated, many of them decorated, uh, coming on to give uh, a, apparently dispassionate analysis of what's going on. And they'd always have their maps. You've seen them, right? It's a, there's a core of them that you see repeatedly, and then there's a, maybe a larger group that come in less frequently. And the New York Times, although it did this a few years ago uh, and nobody noticed, had a big article just a couple of months ago pointing out that um, these were not dispassionate, unattached, retired uh, military people, you know, magnanimously coming out of retirement to enlighten the American uh, uh, TV viewer about what's going on, what the, the military uh, aspects of these operations. These were, uh, these were men who were regularly briefed by the Pentagon, not just by the Pentagon, by high ups including uh, Dick uh, Cheney, or Dick Cheney as uh, Chris Matthews calls him, uh, on a regular basis. And they knew that if they were to dissent from the administration's line in giving their dispassion and analysis, that they would lose their access to the briefings. That's that's a very serious punishment for these guys. Now, I haven't even given the whole story yet because that would be bad enough. And losing access is enough of a, a, a disincentive for them to fairly toe the line. Okay, maybe there's a little exception here and there and somebody took issue around the edges, but you know, these guys were not taking, uh, uh, letting us know when we were being handed a, uh, a line by the administration that didn't reflect uh, the, the facts that were actually uh, you know, of what was actually going on there. But what made this even worse was that many of these guys, and maybe, maybe almost all, uh, you know, possibly almost all of them, I uh, forget exactly how the Times put this, were, these guys were either on the boards of defense contractors or were lobbyists who wanted to represent or did represent defense contractors. So they had a double now incentive to toe the line. Not only did they not want to lose their access just for the prestige of having the access and money from the networks to be invited back to be uh, dispassionate analysts, they sold this access to their potential clients and their, and their clients as a reason to choose them as lobbyists, right? You go to a defense contractor and say, I'll lobby for you. Uh, not only do I know a lot of congressmen, because I've been around Washington, and I, and I can get into, the, uh, you know, into their offices and Make, make your case to them for why you, your weapon ought to be bought or whatever, you ought to get the contract. But I'm getting regular briefings every month or whatever 
from Rumsfeld and uh, Cheney and uh, all these other people. And, you know, if you're in the lobbying business, in the defense lobbying business, that's a pretty good card to play if you want to get business rather than someone else who doesn't have that access. Imagine. So they're not going to want to lose such access. Well, th think about how corrupt the system is with the networks being full participants in it, parading every night on television to the American people these, and you know how people feel generally about retired military officers. There's a certain respect, maybe even awe. They're, uh, well, they're not in uniform, of course, they're retired, but it always says, you know, major, general, whatever, retired. Uh, and, and they'll be introduced to someone who's been highly decorated, fought in Vietnam, got them one of the medals, you know, Purple Heart, whatever. You always, they always recite the credentials. And mo so most people are saying, okay, this, this guy's probably given me the straight scoop. The, the, uh, the network's never let on that these guys were, had, a, had a vested interest. And, and were just really mouthpieces for the administration. The, uh, it was a page one story, I think on a Sunday in the New York Times, and then almost, it, it was almost never mentioned anywhere. Uh, as Glenn Greenwald has documented, none of the networks have ever even defended themselves or explained it or tried to say there's nothing wrong with it. They just let it go away. Uh, I, I, as I learned from uh, Glenn's um, blog, which I highly recommend to people at salon.com, it's a, it, vital source of information, very well researched facts. It's all facts, it's not just him saying his opinions, I think this, I think that. I mean, it's so empirically uh, oriented that uh, it's tremendously valuable. Uh, I, according to Glenn, the last I checked that he's uh, written about this, uh, uh, Howard Kurtz, who's the media reporter for the Washington Post and also a media, uh, he's on CNN, he does a program reliable sources. He's about the only person who's mentioned this story in, in, on any of the networks and the fact that the networks have uh, not been talking about it. It was not covered as a story, well, for obvious reasons. Uh, Brian Williams of, uh, uh, of uh, NBC, uh, uh, Anchorman, uh, has never said anything about it on the air, but he does have a blog, and apparently some of his readers goaded him into finally saying something on the blog, not on television, but on the blog, and, and, and uh, Glenn reproduced it, reprinted the comment and all that, and it was the, it was the lamest excuse you could ever imagine, like, uh, you know, nobody did any spin on my watch. You know, that was, that was like the, base, the whole answer. Uh, totally absurd. But this is, this is how we're, we're manipulated. Now, you know, uh, those of us in this room, uh, don't fall for it. We know where to read other things, and we begin with the skepticism, the healthy skepticism. So, uh, but think of the, the, just the mass of the American people who are busy making a living, raising their kids, just worried with the day-to-day -day stuff and are not philosophically or ideologically oriented. Uh, they are maybe just watching this stuff. They may, you know, they don't, the polls show that people don't think we should have gone into Iraq or the U.S. Should, uh, government should have gone into Iraq, uh, and they may think you know, we need to get out of this uh, in some way. But, you know, they're not out in the streets, right? They're not uh, screaming. Uh, and some of it may have to do with this uh, propaganda, and that's the only word, proper word for it, that they're, get, they're being fed on a daily basis, that things are going well there. And you know about the, the media events, you know, McCain walking through, you know, allegedly walking through a marketplace totally safe, and then we find out, oh, well, no, it wasn't exactly that, was it? Uh, and you've got to read people like uh, Glenn Greenwald and others to, to, to see that. Um, so it's the matrix, right? I mean, it's like the matrix, just not, uh, you know, more metaphorically. Now, uh, one of the great myths we live by, part of the, part of the matrix, is that this, the state protects us, protects our freedom, protects us. Government protects us. And Jeff, Jeff Hummel, Jeffrey Hummel, who I'm a big fan of, he's a great historian, great uh, economist. I recommend his book on the Civil War, the war between the states, if I can use a more neutral term. Uh, there are other terms I could use for it, but uh, it'll take up too much of my time. But anyway, uh, um, fr freeing slaves and, and, and emancipating slaves and, and um, enslaving free men, highly recommend it to you. Uh, he makes a point that, it, you know, the truth is actually the opposite, that the state doesn't protect us. We protect the state.